I'll try not to make it a long sermon. Actually, it could well be, if you listen attentively, it could be relatively short. But I hope it has a good, it has a good message for you. Um, there's something I want to deal with, but I'll do it during the sermon. The walls of Jericho. You know the story. The year probably, you could argue about it, about 1415 BC. 1415 BC. That would be about the time uh, when that occurred. The walls will fall. I want to explain to you what actually happened. Now, if you look at the historical setting, the Israelites, after 40 years of... Uh, roaming around in the wilderness, had finally come to the borders there of the promised land, and they obviously had to cross the River Jordan. They had to cross the River Jordan at the worst possible time of the year, when it was an absolute torrent, a violent torrent of water that was making its way here, as you can see, to the Dead Sea. Jericho is about seven miles north of the Dead Sea. Now, strategically, they had to cross firstly into the promised land where you have a hostile population. These are the Amorites. They already had defeated the Amorites on this side, but now they had to deal with the Amorites on that side. And God provided a miraculous crossing at the Jordan. And I'm just going to presume that you're familiar with that. Because God did actually part the water. He blocked the water. This is in itself a fantastic. The people in Jericho uh, didn't think, never expected this to happen because there was an Israelite camp for three months there and they didn't think they would dare to try to cross that river at the worst time of the year when the melting snows of Mount Hermon would swell the river to such an extent that you simply couldn't cross it. Now, then they hear that they have crossed. And that frightens the daylight out of them. Because that could only happen in a miraculous way. And now the Israelites are camping here at Gilgal. That's the, the name in Hebrew. Gilgal. Now, the interesting thing is this. The name Gilgal means rolling away. It has nothing to do with the river. But it has everything to do with their relationship with God. You know, within two years, they were standing at the borders of the promised land. Within two years, when they had, lo when they had left Egypt. And God said, go in. And they wouldn't do it. They were afraid. They didn't trust God. They disobeyed. You remember that? They, they jeopardized their covenant with God. And they went back into the wilderness for almost 40 years. And every man of fighting age died in the desert, the Sinai Peninsula, with the exception of Caleb and Joshua. Now, during that time, there had been no circumcision. You know, the writ of circumcision, which is typical of the covenantal relationship between the Jews or the Israelites and their God. There had been no celebrating of the Passover, so fundamental to their religious understanding of their relationship with God. Here at Gilgal, God directed Joshua to instruct the priest to do the circumcision on every male that had not been circumcised, which was pretty well all of them, and he, they had their Passover. And that must have been a very moving, a very uh, profound happening to them. And so God had rolled their approach away, and hence the name Gilgal. Do you now understand what that means? It's always nice to know what the, what the names actually teach. Uh, Jericho, Jericho, means his moon. They were worshippers of Esteros, who was a moon goddess. This was a hotbed for absolute worst, the vilest paganism that you could perhaps imagine. And so, we are going to look at the Battle of Jericho. 
There's a good song on the Battle of Jericho, this Negro spiritual. I would have liked that for a special item. Jackie, can you change that? <laughs> Uh, just a few artist in, 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 in impressions. The wall around that city, it, wasn't, it, it was probably not a lot more than 300 meters, 300 yards, maybe 350. I don't think it was, was more. The city was not huge, but the city was so fortified and you had to take the city because if you did not take that city, if you wanted to go further into that land, you would always be dogged by this fortification and they will fight you in the rear. So there was no way that you could proceed to take possession of the promised land unless you dealt with Jericho. You have to conquer Jericho. There's something else that I might just like to... Uh, l l let me go back here a little bit. When you look at Israel and you look at all the names of the places and what, what, what's happening there... There is a whole gospel story, there is a whole gospel story in that land. Let me explain something to you, let me explain. The River Jordan, Yardan, and I'm just going to, I think I've dealt with this before, but I want you to understand it. Yardan means what? It means descending. Descending into what? The Dead Sea. The Dead Sea. When you think of the Dead Sea, there are two places you should think of. What were they? There were actually five. Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom, Gomorrah, that means burning, uh, 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 flooded or, or covered with water. Judgment. So you have a river that descends you in the judgment. And God's people have to cross that judgment. You, me, all of us sitting here, we have to cross the judgment. And you can't do that by yourself. You need God. You need God to get past the judgment. Are you with me? Now he helps you pass the judgment. Now he takes you to Gilgal because he wants to roll away your approach. He helps you. He wants to roll away your reproach. He renews the covenant relationship with you. He renews, uh, renews the relationship with you. You draw closer together. And whatever the offenses are that you have committed, he will roll it away. And then you deal with Jericho. You must deal with with Jericho, you must deal with the Jericho in your life. Because that's the application. Okay. That wall over that point there would have been about over 50 feet tall. This probably is 38 to, 90, to 39 feet tall. Massive stones, bricks, houses wide enough to run all the horses and the wagons. Uh, that fortification which contained within it an oasis which gave you plenty of water, that was almost an unsurmountable uh, fortification that you couldn't take. The Israelites had no idea how to take a city. Now it wasn't big, but it was strong. And any army, any army that would surround that area, which was a barren area, had to make sure about their logistics to make sure that the water kept being supplied. And that was always a pain and an effort. And most of those, what shall we say, armies that surrounded it, that tried to besiege it and, and conquer it, always so far had failed. It was rather invincible. This, of course, is what you see today. That's sort of the rubble down here. Now, that's important because I'm going to come back to this point. I'm going to come back to this. We pick up the story there in Joshua 5. Now, Joshua, it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho. Joshua is walking close to Jericho, and no doubt he is looking at the walls. He is considering the walls. And how is he... It must have gone through his mind as the, as the leader of the army, the leader of the Israelites, he has succeeded Moses. How is he going to accomplish this? Now, 
Joshua was a very godly man, and no doubt he had prayed. He understood one thing. This is the first object lesson. The one thing that we must understand is we must pray. If you want to run before you can run, you have to learn how to kneel. And so Joshua was one of those people. He lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, a man stood opposite him. Suddenly, out of the blue, there is a warrior standing in front of him. He has no idea who it is. He has no idea where he comes from. He is confused about the status of this particular person. Particularly, the sword was drawn in his hand. He looked menacing, but Joshua was not one to run away. He was willing to engage him, if that's what it takes. And so he, he, he starts a dialogue here, which goes like this. Joshua went to him. <clears throat> he doesn't run away, he walks up to him. And he says to him, are you for us or for our enemies, our adversaries? He wants that person to identify himself. And so the answer that he gets is incredible. Uh, hardly expected. He said, the man he questioned, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Here we are. So we pray. Joshua prayed. He looks at the walls. He looks at the difficulties. We come back to that. Then suddenly someone is there, unexpected. He questions him. And the person identifies himself as who? I think it is vitally important, as we are sitting here and considering this story, who this man is. And if you know who this is, it will encourage you in your battles with your Jerichos, because they are around. And so he identifies himself as the commander of the army of the Lord. What is fascinating here, who would you think of? Who would conjure up in your mind as the person that this may be? Yeah, me too. That's exactly right. And you're right. Michael, we, we dealt with it in the Sabbath school. Somebody asked the question, Michael the Arch, Arch Angel. Archangel, archangel, arche means in the, in the act of tense, the cause, the creator of all the angels. There's only one archangel. I know you might come from a different religious background. There's only in the Bible one archangel. Arche means he is the first cause of all the angels. And his name is Michael, Michael, who is like God. And that, is, and that is a very good question. I, I should really give you that reward for that, but that's not the question that I asked. <laughs> okay. But there it is. There it is. And don't start looking up. The, uh, yeah, okay. Now that person that we know as Michael the Archangel, in your mind, in your understanding, is who? Yeah, that's Christ. Absolutely. You can prove that from Scripture. Absolutely. He fought on the head of the angels when there was a war in heaven. And he is the enemy of the one who wanted to be like God, like the Most High. Get it? I want to put something in your mind here. Because I want to say about something here later. We have Lucifer. And we have Jesus. We have, let's say Michael. Let's call him Michael. Lucifer cannot claim an eternal past. Is that correct? Do you understand that Lucifer was created? Uh, the one who created him was who? 
Oh, the archangel. Michael created him. Michael created Lucifer. He did not create Satan. Lucifer created and became Satan. It wasn't God's fault. Now, I'll come back on this point, because there's something I want to share with you later. So, <clears throat> the commander of the army of the Lord. You see, what is a reality is this. Joshua saw Jericho as his problem. But he shows up and he takes over. What does he take over? He takes over the problem of Jericho. The problem of Jericho in your life, the one that you can't knock over, you, have to, you need to have the commander of the heavenly host. And then he takes over your problem. Are you understanding what I'm saying here? There's a very big lesson here. Now, Joshua fell on his face to the earth and he worshipped. Was Joshua in any doubt whom he was speaking to? Oh no. Oh no, he was in no doubt. He was in no doubt, he worshipped him and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Now, I know that whoever appeared to him as a commander of the heavenly host could have never been just an angel. How do I know that? At this point, how do I know that? And angels will not accept worship. Very good. An angel will not accept worship. That worship goes to God. And there are a few beautiful examples of that, particularly in the book of Revelation, where the angel stops it instantly. Yes. Instantly. So this is not an angel. This is God. That's the important part. Then he says to the... Uh, uh, to, to, to the question of Joshua, take your sandal off your foot for the place where you stand is holy. It's quite a humbling thing to do that. Certain places of worship, like a mosque, you take your shoes off before you go in and when you come back, you hope they're still there. <laughs> Same in the Buddhist temple. I've lost a pair of shoes like that. I had a friend and he lost it too, and he, they were just new. And nobody wanted to know about it. I told them to wear thongs, anyway. So, what is the purpose of taking off your shoe? Let, let me explain. You know the book of Ruth? Are you familiar with the book of Ruth? There is a man by the name of Boaz. And that means in him is strength. He is actually a type of Christ. Because he becomes the redeemer of Ruth, who has no capacity of herself. And so it is really a Christ and his bride, if you like. What is interesting, there is a closer relative. Do you know the story? There is a closer relative. It's about the land. But it's not just about the land, it's about the girl. Now the closer relative wants the land. But he doesn't want the girl because the offspring between them, they will own the land and he won't. And there's, a, there's an allegory there. We have a closer, we have, as we are sitting here, we have a closer relative and his name is Satan. He wants, he wants to take this territory, this planet. But you'll get nothing from him. And then there is the Redeemer, the one who will pay any ransom to set you free. There's a beautiful allegory in the story of the book of Ruth. It is the gospel in total. And the way they express 
the way it is expressed is this, that the deal is settled that the closer relative takes off his sandal and he gives it to Boaz. Because the land you stand on is supposed to be the land that you own. Say it in the book of Job, he roams around, uh, where he walks, he owns it. Well, what God is saying here, what God is saying here to Joshua, I own this land. There's a saying, there's a saying that says this, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he owns the hills as well. Now, he tells Joshua, this is my territory, not yours, not theirs. I decide what goes. It's a matter of authority. So, that's the first lesson. The first lesson you've got to learn, your Jericho is not your battle, it is the battle of God. Because that is his property, it involves his property, it's not yours, it's not your entitlement, it is his entitlement. You've got to get your mind right when it comes to God. Now, Joshua did so, of course he did, of course he did. You know what's interesting? Joshua here meets Joshua. He does. He does. The name in Hebrew, Yehoshua. Yehoshua means God saves. The Hebrew name for Jesus was Yehoshua. Same name. Yeshua is the shorter version in Aramaic. But it's, they have the same name. He meets his namesake. I just thought it was interesting. He does. It doesn't happen very often to me that I do. Can't remember it ever happened. Joshua meets his namesake. Object lesson. He is looking at the wall. He is looking at the problem. Most of us get no further than that. We look at the wall of Jericho. And we can't take Jericho. We're looking at the problem. And we can't overcome Joshua is now looking at the captain. He's now looking at the commander. He is now looking at the one who can do it. And so it is not the battle of Joshua. Jericho is not your battle either. The strategy, that is the interesting part, the strategy is set by God. And you want to see the strategy that, that God comes up with. This is Jesus, this is, this is Michael, this is uh, uh, one of the members of the eternal Godhead. He comes up, he doesn't tell him to get a, a, a ramps and, and, and instrumentation to get over those blessed walls that you normally can't get over, or how to starve them out, or what have you. He, he, he is not telling them that the strategy is the most unlikely procedure, and God says do it. If you want Jericho, if you want to conquer Jericho, you may have to resort to the most unlikely methodology. Very much against the grain. Worship God and then tackle the problem. That's the first one. Don't tackle the problem first and then worship God. Do it the other way around. You worship God and then you go to Gilgal and then you go to Jericho. You worship the commander, and then he'll fight with you. Now, looking at the walls leads to fear. You ever have a sleepless night? You can't sleep. You can't switch off. You just can't switch off. You're looking at a wall, and there's no door. You're looking at a wall, and you think, what am I doing? Where is it leading to? You need to look at God. Because looking at God leads to faith. You're much better off, by the way, you are much better off with faith than you would be with fear, ever. You understand me? Very true, very true. 
Okay. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand. It's king, it's mighty man of valor. He said, I've given the whole caboodle to you already. Jericho is still standing there. The people in Jericho, the army that thinks they can last for, for years and years, they do not see it as a possibility that that army of ex-slaves will conquer them. And that's the interesting part. God says, oh, don't worry about what they think. I've given them into your hands already. Imagine, yeah, indeed, imagine getting into a relationship with God that whatever your problem is, however big it is, I mean this, the Bible teaches it, not me, the Bible does, that God says, it's already over. Are you with me? But you must let go of that. And so, you shall march around the city, all your men of war. Now, you shall go around the city, you shall go around the city once, this you shall do for six days. I want you to know that they walked for six days, six consecutive days, they walked around that city once. Now, let me, let me paint you a picture. It's the army, partly up front, the Ark of the Covenant is there, because God leads the priest. The only sound, the only sound is the trumpets. I come back to that, and then there's the rest of the army. They would have had a few hundred thousand men. A few hundred thousand men, an army, silently, as we will see, they march around this city, and it's not big. Maybe not a lot bigger than three football fields, if that means anything to you. Not to me anymore, not since Holland uh, lost. I, I. Now, so, that would have, I think that would have been very intimidating. It would have been intimidating for those who were in Jericho, those who would oppose you. It would have been intimidating. But you are looking at the walls. You have no way of going through. Why didn't he, why didn't he, why didn't he allow them to take it the first day? There was a purpose why God said, walk around that city actually for seven days. It's amazing. Hey, God does not necessarily give you the victory on day one. Will you accept that? Okay, uh, or day two, or three. God is timing. God has a purpose. Every morning, that army walks around that wall. How are we going to get over that wall? How do we get in there? Every day. Look at the story. But the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times. It's not a big city, but it's a big army. And that army walks around that city, Jericho, that they know they can't take unless there is a divine intervention. Your Jericho will require a divine intervention. And so, and so they march seven times, and that is what happens. Marvelous what, what, what happens. And when, when he... Uh, when you hear, he says to Joshua, the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout, then the wall of the city will fall. The Hebrew is very specific. It says that it will fall flat. Do you know that that city of Jericho, there is a Jericho today near the ancient site, because God had said that the ancient site would never be rebuilt. Some tried, there's a story in Kings, quite interesting, I'll bypass it. And he made certain predictions on that, and they, they found place. Archaeologists have found the rubble of that ancient walled city. The walls never fell inwards, the wall never fell outwards, the walls fell like a demolition. Remember the Twin Towers? Like, uh, you know, a controlled, a controlled demolition. It imploded. 
And that's what they found. Just as the writer said, on an event that, that found place uh, more than 3,000 years, uh, 3,500 years ago almost. It's incredible, isn't it? The Bible is a book of accuracies. The Bible is very good. Now, I want to talk about the person. I want to talk about the person. Uh, it's interesting that when you, when you consider that, what Joshua went through, uh, he told the people to be silent. They all had to switch their mobiles off. Obviously, you do the same here. <coughs> no text messages. Not a word was spoken. Sometimes it's good to be silent. Sometimes it is, you know. Just do the walking. And let God work for you. There's the message too. The Son of God. We talked about that in the Sabbath school. His name is Joshua, just like Joshua, the Son of Man. That's who he is. You'll find it in John 8. Your father Abram rejoiced to see my day, he told the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, uh, Abram lived 19 centuries before this moment. And they said to him, you're not 50 years old yet, and you have seen Abram. Pull the other one. And what did Jesus say? He said, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abram was, and that indicates the beginning, I am. Now that statement, we talked about this. You see, we have in front of us a Bible, and we treat it like it is an ordinary document. You're wrong. It's not. Firstly, it is a Hebrew document. Hebrews are Semitic. When you use this expression, I am, in the linguistic reality of the Hebrew language, there is no present tense for the verb to be. And any expression that deals with the present tense can only be afforded to God. I am. And I am is not being there in just a moment of time. I am, in the Hebrew mind, means I am eternity. I am the God that's always there. And because I am, you are. If there would have been nothing in the past, nothing, there would be nothing here now. Do you understand? You and I have an infinity to accept. I can't explain it, and even if I could, you wouldn't understand it. I can't go back in time because even if I found the beginning, what happened before that? No more that I could find the end of the universe. I come to the end of the universe. What will I find behind the back gate? We are finite people, but there is a being that transcends all of that, and his name is Yavah or Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton. Now, this is the reaction of the Jews. This proves that what I said is absolutely correct. They, the Jews, took up stones. Why? They wanted to kill him because stoning is a methodology of execution of the Hebrews, of the Jews. They wanted to kill him. Why? Because he was guilty of blasphemy. Blasphemy, folks. He was guilty of blasphemy in their eyes because he puts himself, he made himself, he said, I am God. Meaning, the everlasting God. The God of no beginning. The God who transcends eternity. He comes to Joshua to help him with Jericho. How about that? How about the fact that an eternal God is interested in helping you to conquer Jericho? It's still true today for every one of you here. Do you understand? Yes. Folks, it's true. Now, because you go back to Exodus 3, 
and there's Moses. And God said, I want you to go back and get those Israelites out of the house of bondage, out of Egypt. And Moses is trying to duck for cover. He doesn't want the job. And he says to God, he thinks he might have a case. These people won't know you anymore. Uh, who can I say? Who should I say sent me? And what did God say? I am. That I am. Aye, asher, aye. I am who I am. That's the same word that Jesus used. And they knew, they knew, when Jesus said, I am, they were dealing with one who claimed to be God. I am who I am. And that is true. And that is the self-existing one. That's the tetragrammaton. You find it in verse 7 of chapter 3. There is the introduction of the one who is speaking to Moses. It is God. The self-existing God is speaking to Moses. And that is his name. And that is the name Jesus took. Um, if you don't mind, um, some of you were here in the uh, first session. Let, let's just run past it again. Uh, the angel Gabriel tells that, that young woman, M uh, Mary, her, her Hebrew name would be Miriam. And, 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 and he, he says... Uh, he will be called the son that is going to, she's going to have. He will be called what? The son. Now, I'm going to have a need of your attention here. Of late, there has been a serious incident where literature and DVDs are distributed by those who very much work behind the scenes and they are anti-Trinitarians. Now I want you to understand that I don't particularly mind if anybody wants to be an anti-Trinitarian, that is your right. I'll respect you no less. But the belief of our church as described in the fundamental beliefs upholds a triune Godhead whom we know by the name as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, because that is how we know them in the plan of salvation. If you don't want to believe aspects of that, we call it then Trinity, an unfortunate name, Godhead is better, a triune Godhead. That is your choice if you reject that. But what is not a choice is to distribute DVDs and literature and actively engaging in canvassing, particularly new believers, in rejecting the fundamental beliefs that are told here from the front, right where I'm standing. Can you understand that? I particularly found it disappointing when it was given to a member and the message was, uh, uh, you read this, this is good, you, you watch this, but don't tell Barrent. I hear of it the same day, don't I? It's wrong to do this. It doesn't come from God. Because this Trinitarian says about Jesus, and I'm not speaking here of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus, somewhere in the past, somewhere pre Bethlehem, somewhere pre creation, somewhere in the eternal past, did come forth as the Son of God. God. And therefore, Jesus, they don't use the word created. They know it doesn't look good. But somewhere along the line, he was made. Do you understand? You know the argument of Lucifer, the biggest thing that really irked him, that really, really got right up his nose, was that he was a created being and there's nothing he could do about it. When he said, I want to be like the Most High, I want to be God, he couldn't be. Because he was made. He was created. If God is created, he ceases to be God. And only a God of an eternal past can give you eternal life. Make no mistake. There's no other way. 
will be called the Son of the Highest. When will that child be called the Son of the Most Highest? Before it is born or when it is born? It's future. It's the future. He is not called by that name. That name is exclusively related, pertaining to his incarnation by being born as a human being there in Bethlehem. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the highest will overshadow you, therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called, will be called, not right now, will be called when that happens, the Son of God. Now let me explain one more principle of the Semitic language which Hebrew is one of. When you are called the son of, it means you're like him. Do you understand? When Jesus, uh, often he was called uh, Yeshua Bar David. That's Aramaic. Why was he called the son? David lived a thousand years before. I'll tell you why he was called. Not just a lineage. It was not just an explanation of a generic beginning. It was they wanted King David. Boot the Romans out. Rise up this nation. And that's why they rejected Jesus because they had the wrong vision of who he was. I warn you, when people try to give you the wrong vision of Jesus, the second member of the Godhead, I'd like you to reject it, I'd like you to report it to me, and I will speak to these people and tell them to desist from doing this. They are in serious error. You are free to believe what you want, but not to do the canvassing that has per been perpetrated. Now, the Son of God will be called the Son of God because of Bethlehem. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. I want you, do you ever get Jehovah's Witnesses on your door? Not so long. Okay, ah, well, I haven't seen them for a while either. I like them. They're nice people. Honest. The voice of one crying in the wilderness is about who? Which John? John the Baptist. What was he to do? Prepare the way of the? The Lord. the Lord. Ah, that's interesting. That comes from Isaiah, isn't it? Quoted in the New Testament. That word there, that word Lord, is of course, some say Jehovah, others say Yahweh or Yahweh. It means the existing one. If he is preparing the way for Jesus, who is Jehovah, who is Yahweh, who is the eternal God, then I would have a problem with the name Jehovah's Witnesses because it's a misnomer. Because if you're a true Jehovah's Witness, you testify, you witness of Jehovah. Jesus is Jehovah. I can give you many examples. Many, 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 many. You Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are little amongst the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be the ruler in Israel. Who's this? Yes, it's Jesus. Whose going forth are from of old. Mickey Day means a long time ago. But know this. The writer wants to speak Specialized. He wants to make sure that you get the right interpretation. He says from everlasting, May Olam is no beginning. Jesus, the ruler in Israel, had no beginning because he is Yehovah. Yehovah. He is Jehovah, if you like. If that's what you have to call him, I don't think that was ever the name of God, but that's a different story. Are you with me here? What I'm trying to tell you here, what I'm trying to teach you here, that the great God of the universe who came to this planet, there is no higher being. 
It wasn't a second-rate deity. That's what I'm trying to tell you. It was God himself. Abram walks with Isaac up Mount Moriah. And he has a question for his father. He said, uh, here is the wood, here, here is the fire. He says, but where's the sacrifice? What did Abram say? The Lord, the Lord, will provide. The Lord will provide. Yevah Yireh. He, he, he named that mountain Yevah Yireh. Now that became later as Mount, or was already known as Mount Moriah. Mori is, is my teacher. Yah is the abbreviated form of the Lord. Yevah. God taught Abram. God shared with his friend what it is like to offer your son. That was a very special relationship. Now, God provides himself. If there is one lesson in the whole of the universe, if there is one lesson that will never be forgotten throughout eternal ages, if there is one lesson to be learned, God sends the highest paid, the highest price he could possibly pay for your salvation. Himself. No discount. No shortcut. Himself. Do we understand this? And can you see that Satan would have an interest in trying to reduce that event? Are you with me? That's the point. That's the point. Everlasting. It can't be clearer than that. Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, nor shall your word proceed out of your mouth. Mobiles off. Until the day I say to you, shout, and then you shall shout. And that is it. You know how the walls came down? The walls of Jericho, Paul says, came down by faith. That's how they came down. What was the mechanical force? It's not your problem. The commander, the host, God himself, the self-existing God, implodes your problem and the walls of Jericho. And all you got to do is walk in and put the kettle on. No, I mean, forget that last bit. <laughs> By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. It was faith. When the time came, the walls fell down. Everyone knew it was an act of God. There was nobody outside the wall. There was nobody inside the wall who did not believe in the God of the Hebrews. One day, one day, in a little over a thousand years from now, there will be people outside the wall. There will be people inside the wall. And everybody knows that he will be God. True? True? Oh yes, oh yes, Jericho is a, is a huge lesson for us, a huge lesson. That's the Berlin Wall. Now I know you might not believe this, but I'm old enough to remember this. August 61, it came up. Terrible what they did. Terrible. Do you remember that photograph? See, people were coming down houses, they had hot air balloons, there was one bloke, him and his wife, and his mother-in-law in the trunk, and he had a very low little sports car, and he removed the windscreen, and so he came up to the checkpoint, and they told him to pull over, and he went straight under that boom, because he figured out it was only three feet high. Mother-in-law at all. So, 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 I don't know why I took her as well. Anyway, so... <laughs> They did it with, they, they were, they were a, a senior, seniors group. These men, they dug a, 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 a tunnel and they could actually walk because they were going to walk into freedom, not crawl into freedom. And they got that way. There were people that, a train driver, he crashed his train through that wall. And about 16 people got out. A few returned to the family on the other side, but there it is. This man is very interesting. It's a great escape. Konrad Schumann was his name, and he did that in August 1561. There were only three days ahead. That wall, there was just this barbed wire, and he, he threw down that rifle, 
and uh, he, he jumped to freedom and he worked in, uh, in Bavaria there for a long time uh, as, a, as, a, as a mechanic. But at least he had freedom. Freedom is everything, guys. November 1989, that wall came down. You know, walls, why am I putting this up? Walls are man-made. Did you know that? Our walls, by and large, are what? Man-made. That's the problem. That's the problem. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. You remember him? Yeah. Because the waiter dropped a bit of red wine on his forehead. Remember that? <laughs> he was a brave man. He dissolved the Soviet Union. A brave man. But that was good advice. Walls of many kinds. You can be unclear, perplexed, disoriented, bewildered, confused, and short. You can be lost. Walls come in many, many different forms. But here is the truth. If you want to be unhappy, uh, uncomfortable, and insecure, just spend your life trying to do something that's not right for you. Yeah? It's like trying to wear shoes that don't fit. Friend of mine, he's about my age. He said, he said, I can tell I'm getting older. He said, he said, I got so depressed, I went to church. He's a Sunday worshiper. He, he said, I went to church on Sunday. And he said, I felt I felt uncomfortable. Walking was a pain. And I sat there and I sat there and I said, Oh Lord, I don't want to get old. And then he looked at and the left right, the left shoe was on the right one, and the right shoe was on the left one. <laughs> Right, that's what it's like. We do it to ourselves. We do, we do. Here, a couple of things to get rid of. Pride. Envy. Greed. Status. Oh, if only you could let go of that last bit. The recognition of men accounts for nothing. So, different walls. When we put our problems in God's hands... He puts his peace in our heart. You want peace in your heart? Give him this. Give him your baggage. Give him your luggage. And he'll take away that wall. All have sinned. That is true. We know that. And, and come short of the glory of God. There's no doubt about it, folks. That is true. But the Bible, you must understand something. The Bible is not a book to be explained as much, though it should be explained, but not as much as a book to be obeyed. You have to obey. Joshua obeyed Joshua. <laughs> you understand? Yeah, well, more or less. They were namesakes. Do you understand? Yes, he, he obeyed them. He followed the instruction. To the point. Yeah, absolutely. And there was a Sabbath included, and it was all right to do that on the Sabbath. It's permitted to do good on the Sabbath. Don't tell me what to do. I'm not telling you what to do. God is telling you what to do. If you want to reach the other side, you got to start thinking differently. It's not you. It isn't you. For the wages of sin is... But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ our Lord. True? True? But you ever feel sometimes that you are tied down on something. There is this ball and chain and you can't get rid of it. You wish you could, but you can't. What do you do? You would like to conquer. And you can fill in the blank. You would like to conquer that which you know is between you and God. It's a wall need to get rid of it. Pray, and the eternal God of the universe will come and see you. And he will help you. And he'll make it his Jericho. Before we can be conquerors, folks, there's something we need to do. We must be conquered ourselves. No point in giving God a job for a day or a day and a half. He becomes the God of your life. That's the important part. No victory either without a battle. You may have a battle, but the battle will be won. He already has, hey, he already has given Jericho in your hands. 
but you need to take it. You need to walk around it. He'll tell you what to do. You do it. You do it. So, when you come to your Jericho, you have two choices. Let's face it, folks. Face it or... But where are you going when you run away from your problem? You are going back into the wilderness. Is that what you want? You can't. You can't. You shouldn't. Abram Lincoln, I really admire that man. He lost his elections nine times. He went bankrupt twice, lost a very beloved fiancé, had a nervous breakdown, and then he became president. <laughs> he became president. Abram Lincoln, this is what he said. Sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. People always worry whether God is on their side. This man saw it. He said, my greatest concern is to be on God's side. It's not about, I see these soccer teams. They walk up the field and they're all blessing themselves and there are people praying. Not the Dutch team, they don't do that anymore. And, 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 they, and sometimes you see two teams, they're, they're both praying. And I think to myself, I'm so glad I'm not God. Who shall I let win today? <laughs> but you know, they both believe they have God on their side. But it can't. It can be a draw, but that, <laughs> then they have a penalty shootout. Now, God is always right. That's what he said. This man, with that attitude, ended the atrocity of slavery. He did. What a legacy. What a legacy. Here is a bit of counsel here. The will of God will never take you, I want you to get this, the will of God for you will never take you where the grace of God will not protect you. God is never asking the impossible from you. You understand? Because if it's impossible, he'll do it. But he will ask the possible of you. He will. He will. We have only God on our side, but it's enough. Don't let other people define you. You know people want to say who you are, what you are. Don't let them do that. Don't let them do that. They're not important in their opinion. I'm telling you, there's only one opinion that counts. In God we trust they, they have on their side. You can have trust and faith in God, but you must have God on your side. <coughs> Sometimes you get it wrong, and you won't get away with it. Uh, only God can define you. Only God can define you. God knows who you are, and he loves you, by the way. And he'll come to you, too. When you pray and you have a Jericho, he comes to you. He does. He does. We need to be sure we are on God's side. Be firm then to keep all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. That's the only Bible portion they had. So that you may not turn aside from it to the right or to the left. That man had good counsel. Choose for yourself today whom you will serve. The question to you here today, if you haven't made up your mind, the question for you, everyone of us here today, is who will you serve? As for me and my house, that's what he said. We will serve the Lord. Start serving the Lord. And your Jerichos are already given into your hand. As he stood there with Jesus on that mountain, and he tried to entice him, and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world, offered him the shortcut, the easy way, and Christ wouldn't do it. He showed him, he stood there up on the temple. The, Satan couldn't have picked a worse place, because that temple, every aspect of that temple, testified of Jesus. Every single thing about that temple pointed to Jesus. He couldn't have taken him to a place where he could be more conscious of himself than the temple. But that's Satan for you. So he takes him there and he, he entices him to test God by jumping. Well, he didn't do that. You see, both the Hebrews and all of us here, the wall doesn't fall and the wall will not fall. You see, it would never break Satan's power. 
whatever he had an offer. There was another wall. The wall cannot fall. Your walls cannot fall uh, until the walls of your heart fall. Jesus had surrendered himself to the will of his Father. You have to do the same. You have to do the same. It'll pay off wonderfully. Victory is not achieved through fighting. It is received through what? Faith. Faith. And by the way, obedience. Because faith leads to obedience. There it is. There it is. You have need of endurance, Paul said, so that after you have done the will of God, note this, you may receive the promise. You've got to hang in there. Don't you give up. Do the will of God, and Jericho is yours. He'll has promised the victory, and the walls will fall. They will absolutely fall. God bless you. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you. It's the song said, we, uh, we have such hope, haven't we? We have such assurance because of what the Most High God did for us. No greater price could ever have been paid for us. Help us to understand that and help us to see that and help us to help others to see that. That wonderful news that your love is that strong. Lord, we thank you for being our God. We thank you for the promises, the endless ages, when we shall share eternity. Lord, what bliss that will be to see you and live. Help each and every person here to make the right choices. Make us strong. Keep us well. And Lord, keep us faithful. Lord, we also pray for the food that will nourish our bodies. We thank, we thank you for that. We ask for the blessing. We pray for the fellowship that goes with it. That the sweetness of the hour spent here may be with us in the days to come until we meet again for worship and study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. God bless you.